we must begin to believe that God, in the mystery of prayer, has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and can bring its power down to earth. Table Mountain sits majestically overlooking Table Bay near the southern tip of the African continent. The first European seafarers to take in this site and to navigate these waters were the Portuguese, led by Bartolomeu Dias in 1488, as he tried to navigate a trade route to India. Dias succeeded in circumnavigating the southern tip of Africa, naming it the Cape of Good Hope. He was soon followed by another Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama. He finished what Diaz had started and landed on the shores of India in 1498. It wouldn't be long before Europe's leading seafaring nations would be navigating their way around the Cape of Good Hope in the race to dominate the trade routes to the east. The Dutch East India Company one of Europe's leading trading houses sailing the spice route to the east, decided to make Table Bay a permanent base camp for sheltering and restocking with fresh supplies. An expedition under the leadership of Jan van Riebeck arrived in Table Bay in 1652. They immediately started work on building a fort. The Castle of Good Hope we see here today was started a number of years later in 1666. The Dutch expedition were under instruction not to colonise the Cape. It wasn't long before more food was needed, and so the land was cultivated for farming. Soon conflict would arrive through a series of clashes, because the Dutch took over land from the Khoi Khoi people. They had been in the Cape long before any of the European settlers arrived. In 1687, some 300 French Huguenots came to the Cape of Good Hope, fleeing France, when the French revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Protestants were no longer protected from practicing their faith, but instead arrested, and many were killed. In its early years, the Cape Colony was a spiritual wilderness. The main religion was Dutch Reformed, which Jan van Riebeck brought with him. The Dutch East India Company controlled and appointed pastors and established congregations. In 1795, the Cape was taken by Britain in a peacekeeping mission which ended in guns being fired. It was during the French Revolution and the British wanted to stop the French from gaining control of the Cape and its important sea routes to the east. They returned the Cape to the Dutch and three years later reoccupied it, this time permanently. Lord Charles Somerset at that stage found himself um, involved in a little bit of a squabble with the ultra-orthodox Afrikaner colonists and the English way of doing things did not appeal to them at all. So Lord Charles Somerset got very inventive. He knew he had to touch their minds and also to touch their hearts. In other words, to give them education and to give them religion. And he knew the best place to do that was in their place of worship, and that was the Dutch Reformed Church. When the British took over the Cape, they introduced an Anglicization policy. This meant that English was to become the official language. It was to be spoken and taught in all public schools and civil office. They also attempted to introduce English into the Dutch Reformed Church. The Dutch congregations were pointed to Scotland to find their reformed ministers. Andrew Murray was a Presbyterian minister from Aberdeenshire in Scotland. He was appointed to the frontier parsonage of Hrafrenet in the Karoo, a semi-desert region of the Cape Colony. Hrafrenet has a very long and interesting history. It is, after all, the fourth oldest town in the country. But the village of Hrafrenet and the district of Hrafrenet was established in 1786. The district was a very new district at that stage, but it was also the largest district with over 130,000 square kilometres. Now, of course, the British governor had in mind that the Scottish ministers 
would now preach in English. And this would force the Dutch people in their churches to move from Dutch to English. In fact, their policy had the opposite effect. All the Scottish ministers who came out to Cape learned Dutch. Before Andrew Murray came to Grafrenet, he spent 10 months in the Netherlands where he studied the language to more effectively communicate with the community. Not only did they preach the gospel in Dutch, but they came with a revived fervor and they revitalized the Bible studies, the prayer meetings, the pulpits. When Andrew Murray was appointed by Lord Charles Somerset, his parish included um, the districts of Middleburg, Hopetown, Colesburg, Richmond, Venterstadt and many, many more. He was away from home for weeks up to months at a time and he was usually accompanied by an elder and they travelled by horse wagon. Sometimes they had to traverse very steep areas. The men who also accompanied them had to tie the wheels with rima and rima, you know, is a kind of rope made from animal skin to prevent the wheels from the wagon rolling back over the precipice. Two years after Andrew Murray's arrival on a visit to Cape Town, he met a young lady, Miss Maria Stegman. She became his wife. They had six children. The first was John. Two years later, in 1828, a second son was born, Andrew, named after his father. He was to become one of the most influential Christian authors of his time. His father was given to praying for revival and took uh, every Friday, Friday night, as a time apart there in the pastory to pray earnestly for spiritual awakening. And his children were aware of that. His firstborn son, John, and Andrew would have been listening to their father earnestly crying out for revival every Friday night. Andrew, aged 10, and John, 12, went to further their studies in Scotland and stayed with their uncle in Aberdeen. After several years, both brothers achieved a Master of Arts degree at Marshall College at the University of Aberdeen. While there, a revivalist preacher, William C. Burns, came to Aberdeen and made a remarkable impression on them. The record indicates Andrew as a young boy. He's a teenager. He is carrying the evangelist's black robe and his Bible following uh, this unusual uh, evangelist and would have heard together with his brother evangelistic services and this man was a very gifted evangelist with what we would say signs of great conversions and, and remarkable revivals where he went and so forth. The brothers decided to follow their father into the ministry in the Cape Colony and took a course in theology at the University of Utrecht in Holland. On his journey to Holland, Andrew was born again. In a letter to his parents, he wrote all about it. It was with very great pleasure that I today received your letter containing the announcement of the birth of another brother. And equal, I am sure, will be your delight when I tell you that I can communicate to you far gladder tidings over which angels have rejoiced that your son has been born again. Now this is a boy who was brought up in a Christian home until he was 10. And then he went and stayed with a Christian uncle who was a Presbyterian minister and drilled him on the scriptures every day, who at the age of 17 realizes that a person needs to be born again regardless of whatever their previous exposure to Christianity would have been. After gaining their degrees in theology, they returned to the Cape Colony. While the British had tried to anglicize the Cape, most of the population still spoke Afrikaans. The language barrier was still a hindrance, not only with the British, but also within the Dutch Reformed Church. Afrikaans had developed, starting with Dutch as, a, as the basis, but also incorporating some of the French Huguenot terms and bringing in some German and from the Khoi. And it was a very African version of a European language which had been influenced by many different things. Bear in mind Cape Town was the tavern of the seas and so you had a lot of sailors passing by from different countries. So the cosmopolitan nature of Cape Town and then the trek boers and fortrekkers contacts with the people in the hinterland meant that a very unique kind of language was being developed. But the theologians looked down on this Afrikaans 
to them it wasn't it wasn't suitable for high spiritual sacred use. You could not use Afrikaans in prayer. You could not use this in preaching. You couldn't use it in your own devotions. And so everything still had to be high Dutch in the pulpit, high Dutch Bible, and high Dutch even your personal devotions at home. The circumstances in Southern Africa changed dramatically when there was a migration of Boers from the Cape colony into the interior. That was, in a way, what some of us would call a declaration of independence. Instead of fighting for their rights, which they felt were being uh, trampled on or not respected in the Cape Colony, they said, we'll leave. And if you ever travel on a road today, uh, from the Cape into the interior of South Africa, you will wonder how they did that. There were kilometers and miles and miles of open territory uh, in which they call the Karoo. Only people who had been born and brought up in the rigors of having to depend entirely upon themselves could have survived that. The inland settlements of the Afrikaans people were divided into two political units. One was known as the Orange Free State, named after a river. And then there was the Transvaal, which means across the Vaal River, so both new terms. Now, these were independent, self-proclaimed republics. In 1848, the British annexed the Orange Free State from the Voortrekkers and renamed it the Orange River Sovereignty. They abandoned it six years later. Andrew Murray, he came back to the Cape, but he is only 20 years old. According to the law at that time, you had to be at least 22 years old to be a minister of the gospel in the Cape Colony. And so Sir Harry Smith, the governor of the Cape, determined that what they would do with Andrew Murray is send him across the Orange River into the Orange Free State, what was then the Orange River Colony, and be the first missionary, the first pastor to the Fortrekkers. So Andrew Murray, for the first 11 years of his ministry, was a roving, itinerant, evangelist, missionary, pastor uh, to the Fortrekkers. And he not only ministered to the 12,000 Fortrekkers in the Orange River area, but he even made missionary journeys across the Vaal River to the Transvaal Fortrekkers, and he ministered extremely far and wide. Andrew Murray's uh, parish, we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of uh, kilometers squared. When Andrew Murray Jr. took his post in Bloemfontein, he was just uh, over the age of 20. Andrew is now riding horseback in a large area where settlements are very few. Most people from the Dutch Reformed Church that he would have dealings with would have been farmers. And you're talking about large areas of farming. You're not talking about going down the road and then turning right in so-and-so's farm. You're talking about large, large areas. And so he spent most of his time on trek, visiting individually with members of the Dutch Reformed Church or to see if they were members of the Dutch Reformed Church. Many, of course, would have had of the Boers living in the Free State in those days would have had children with no church around and no minister. So he performed the uh, rites of baptism after explaining that to the uh, people. These would be the people who were cut off from church life. And Andrew had the responsibility of reconnecting them, but practically on the basis of doing it one farm at a time. When he reaches the Fortrick as these tough, hard-bitten farmers whose only books are the Bible and who ha are facing warfare with the Matabili and the Zulus and who have uh, been involved in just a daily struggle for, for survival, they're not interested in this dry theology and these theories and hypothetical. They want practical theology, put feet to faith, the kind of message that really makes sense. So Andrew Murray was forced to revise all of his preaching and not only was he forced to revise his preaching but how he preached. He had to start preaching in Afrikaans which of course would not be allowed back in the Cape Colony when High Dutch was the standard. But he's dealing with four trekkers here. 
it's no good for him to be preaching in high Dutch. So he learns to preach in Afrikaans. He learns to preach in a way that people understand. And he becomes very practical, down to earth. Andrew was requested to go and visit and more and more and more. The Transvaal was uh, questionable because the British uh, were at loggerheads with them. And Andrew was asked not to go into the Transvaal in his official capacity. But he did so during his holidays. Andrew played a vital role of peacemaker by dissuading the fur trekkers north of the Val River from interfering in the affairs of the Orange River sovereignty. He acted as an interpreter at the Sand River Convention in 1852, whereby the British recognized the independence of the Boers north of the Val River. It must have been a real shake-up for him to realize the hunger for the Word of God, the famine for the Word of God in the land. And this gave him an urgency. It gave him a, a sense of uh, dynamism and of seizing the moment to preach every moment as though this is the last message you'll preach. So in a real sense, you can really say the Four Trekkers made Andrew Murray the kind of dynamic preacher he was. But don't forget, uh, Andrew Murray proposed at the Synod meeting in 1856 that the denomination should start a missions sending agency. And they appointed him the director at that meeting, and he stayed that director till he died. In that same year, Andrew Murray married Miss Emma Rutherford. They were to spend the next 48 years together and had 11 children. Andrew Murray's elder brother, John Murray, was also the most important mover to bring about the Quirk School or the Theological Seminary in Stellenbosch because one of the attempts of the church here in the Cape to stem the tide of theological liberalism from Europe was we must have a theological seminary here in the Cape that's going to be true to the scriptures. And along with Domini Hoffmeyer, uh, they got the theological college started, what's called the Quirk School, meaning the growing school to grow theological graduates. The years in the Free State came to an end, and there were calls to fulfill some empty pastorates in the Cape Colony. He felt that the one where he could uh, fit in best would be a place called Worcester. The call of Andrew Murray to the pastorate of the Dutch Reformed Church in Worcester coincided with several ministers had called for regular prayer and were uh, producing writings seeking to encourage people to seek God for revival. And so the subject of revival was being discussed and there was, there was an interest. And the first interdenominational conference ever was held in Worcester in the Cape in 1860. And Andrew Murray came to Worcester at the same time that this revival conference was started. But Andrew Murray had no role in the actual revival conference except for one prayer. And several people reported later that that prayer was so deep and intense and so full of emotion and fervor and zeal that they said, you can safely say the revival of 1860 dates from that prayer. After the conference on revival, which is very theological and considering it from a very biblical and historical and practical point of view, uh, the people dispersed. And on Pentecost Sunday, which was then the 27th of May, 1860, Andrew Murray was inaugurated as the pastor at Worcester Dutch Form Church. So this is Pentecost Sunday, and it's his first sermon. And Andrew Murray comes like a firestorm. After 11 years being trained in the wilderness, he only knows how to preach straight and direct. And the people were shocked. They'd never heard such preaching as this. What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call on thy God. And the people were being spoken to like they were sinners, like they needed to repent, like there was something wrong with it. I mean, they were religious, respectable people. Well, Andrew Murray's sermons are uh, like cannon blasts. He stands up and he preaches, those who believe shall be saved. Those who do not believe shall be damned. How did you come in hither without your wedding garments? And these kind of direct, from the shoulder, very shocking, convicting sermons, not long after 
Andrew had started his uh, work at the church in Worcester. One night, there was a gathering of worshipers, and it's fascinating to read because the, the diacon, the deacon, who was in charge of the meeting, wrote a uh, very uh, significant uh, report on what happened. They had a formal setting. Uh, this would have been the Dutch speaking group. And it wasn't just for white persons. It was white and what we in South Africa call colored. And at one point, this deacon tells the story, uh, a girl in the back, and he refers to her as a plas arbeider, that means a farm worker, a girl, raises her hands and asks if she can lead in a prayer. The deacon acknowledges in his writing of the, that event that he hesitated for a moment. They weren't used to farm girls, colored farm girls, speaking uh, in, the, uh, in the evening service. But he makes this comment. He says, better thoughts took over. And I said, yes. And his eyewitness account is that when she started to pray, there was a sound of wind and the wind got stronger and stronger and stronger. And this resulted in a reaction of everybody in the room falling down on their knees and starting to cry out for forgiveness of sin and their need for revival. At that point, somebody heard this noise looked in the doorway, didn't say anything, and ran off and got Andrew Murray. Dear Andrew Murray walks into this room and everybody's crying and, and shouting and uh, something he'd perhaps never seen before. And the eyewitness account, this is written in the biography of 1919, the recollections of this diacon is that dear Andrew Murray was overwhelmed by this and tried to get the people to stand up and to calm down and uh, seek together to find what this would be about and so forth. And uh, it didn't work. He at one point said, silence, silence, I am your minister. And nobody heard him. He went back to where the deacon was standing and said, let's sing a hymn. And they opened a hymn book and started singing, and that record will tell you what it says. The hymn title was, uh, Help the Soul That on Thee uh, uh, Leans. And the only singers were the diacon and Andrew Murray. And the diacon says, given what I had seen, I felt the best thing for me to do was not to be standing up. And he got down on his knees, at which point Andrew Murray said, ach man, Everything here uh, is, in, is in upheaval. The Bible says that we are to maintain good uh, decorum and be careful in our dealings. And there's no such thing as disorder in church, but there's nothing here but disorder. And at that, he turned and left. The following week, they moved the prayer meeting into the school hall as hundreds of people were joining the meeting. Andrew opened the meeting in prayer and then opened the floor for others to pray. A similar pattern emerged as the previous Sunday. People began to pray, weeping and crying out. Someone passes by the doorway. It's somebody who has been in North America not that long ago and he motions to and Andrew Murray and says, let me just have a word with you for a second. This kind of thing that you're seeing here is what's been happening in North America and in other places where there's strong revival. You might want to be a little bit cautious in a too quick of a reaction. Andrew Murray held back and waited and watched and he perceived this move was of God and he started to see the fruit. And very soon he became a real advocate for the movement and saying it's only natural that the people should express themselves in an emotional way when you're really dealing with such 
dramatic issues of your sinfulness, God's holiness, real repentance. These are not matters that can be done in a lifeless way. As the revival hit, the churches couldn't contain the amount of people. And there they were, farm workers, farm owners. Uh, there were the Afrikaans people, the, the Dutch uh, people, the uh, colored farm workers, all together in the prayer meetings, on their knees, fervently seeking the Lord. And suddenly, all the opposition to evangelism and to missions disappeared. And whereas before, they'd been struggling to ever get enough candidates for theological studies to uh, provide uh, ministers for the pulpits that were needed. Suddenly, they had this influx of 50 theological candidates in one year. You can go all around the Cape and you'll see just about every Dutch formed church that was hit by revival at that time went from being a rectangular building to being a cross-shaped building because they suddenly had to build out wings to the left and wings to the right uh, to accommodate all the new people coming into the church. And then they had to, to build uh, uh, upstairs levels as well and you suddenly had these these balconies being built uh, as you would see in Franschhoek and Stellenbosch and all of these great congregations that were hit by the revival suddenly they had to accommodate more people and so you can see when you go to those churches this wing was added in 1861 or 1862 and when revival hit it hit Worcester, Wellington, Calvinia, Montague, Cape Town, Paul. it was hitting everywhere but not Crawford And Andrew Marasini with tears in his eyes says, my son, you have experienced what I've been praying for for 36 years. And then that next year, as they were having Nachmal, uh, the communion service, and the farmers had come from far and wide into Crawford for this, which was only held quarterly, every three months. And as they began the, the service, the presence of God came down and a service lasted for 48 hours. They, they just couldn't stop. The people sensed the presence of God and it was just such, such a sense of the holiness of God and the presence of God. And so revival came to Crawford at last. It was where it had been prayed for the first and the longest. But in the providence of God, the revival fires came through the son of the main intercessor for it and came there last. And so the news of revival affected the entire Dutch Reformed Church and other churches as well. So much so that there was a new emphasis on other aspects of life in this area that needed attention. And Andrew Murray realized this and the best way for him to deal with those things was to start writing books I, on certain subjects, but all having to do with the Christian's life and scripture and how those go together. It's a wonderful thing to read an Andrew Murray book because they're, they're seamless. The scriptures and what we ought to be doing uh, flow together very, very well in his writings. Andrew Murray started to become one of the most dynamic authors in the history of South Africa. In fact, no South African author has ever written more and had more published and translated in more languages or had more books in print or sold more books in history than Andrew Murray. And his books are still, to this day, extremely popular worldwide. The books are classics. Abide in Christ, with Christ in the school of prayer, the school of obedience. I mean, these books are absolute classics. Two years after the revival broke out in Worcester in 1862, Andrew was elected as the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church. In his position as Voorzitter, or the leader of the Dutch Reformed Church, he's elected six times in a row at the synods every seven years. Gives him the responsibility, or expects from him the responsibility, of visiting all the churches in the Cape, Natal, the Free State, and in the Transvaal. He's meeting a lot of young people who are not in church because there is no church where they are. They know that they belong to the so-called Dutch Reformed Church, but they haven't any contact with it. And he realizes that when he speaks to them, they have a deep desire to learn more. So he writes this book called uh, The New Life. This particular book has uh, 52 chapters, and that's one a week for training in one book for the young people of the Dutch Reformed Church. Each chapter is about three pages long, but if you could see um, up close, 
what you'd notice is Anna Mary's writings are here and at the bottom of every page, it is just one long stream of footnotes, which are Bible verses. Anybody who reads Andrew Murray then and now is going to be introduced to a respect of God's word, which is most unusual. You have to get out your Bible if you're gonna read Andrew Murray. And so he gave people enough information to build a walk with God, even if they weren't close to a church. But when Andrew Murray came back from 11 years ministering to Four Trekkers, and he was able to uh, preach so powerfully and the Holy Spirit power came down, he encouraged the people to pray in their own language, in, in Afrikaans. And when people could see Holy Spirit fire descending and God answering their prayers, all opposition to Afrikaans being used in prayer and devotions dissipated. The Worcester Pastorate continued until Andrew Murray was asked to assume responsibilities at the Murachamenta, now that's Afrikaans for the Mother Church. The Mother Church of the Dutch Reformed Church, you wouldn't be surprised to know, is in Cape Town. There was a fire, it was built in the, in the 17th century, in the 1600s. At one point there was a fire and destroyed most of the building, but the original steeple is still there. And because it's the first church, it's a prestigious place and the person who's going to be the minister there is going to have the attention of the whole of South Africa. Newspapers are printed in the Cape Town. I mean, it's the height of civilization here, you could say, in those days. The other thing is, as the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, if there was a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church who strayed from his oath of allegiance or whatever and preached in such a way as to raise questions, that would call for negotiations and to calm or to find out if it was a mistake or so forth. All those details were falling on Andrew Murray. This actually must have been the most frustrating experience of his life. This, this was no doubt the most traumatic part of his life because in coming to the pulpit in Cape Town, he was torn into church politics and legal battles all the clashes between the theological liberals and those who were attacking the integrity of Scripture, they were continually trying to bring legal suits against the Dutch Reformed Church, which meant the moderator had to be the one who answered and dealt with this, uh, because they were either being denied the pulpits or uh, being disciplined out of the church. And so there was this clash between civil law and church law and doctrinal standards and liberalism and theological controversies. So I think for Andrew Murray, his time in Cape Town was the most unpleasant uh, of his ministry and the most traumatic. His time at the Murakaminta was something he soon realized was not where he wanted to do his main work. It was too much outside influence. And there were various places where he could have gone. Uh, he chooses Wellington. He comes to Wellington. It's a small place. And within the first three months of being here, they, he and his wife, experience a real family tragedy. In 1872, he actually lost two of his children at the early stage. And he went to Patmos in Kalk Bay, his holiday home at that stage. And he was reading a book that was lent to a friend of them, The Work and the Life of Mary Lyon. The book was about the schooling system at that stage at the Mount Holy Oak Seminary in Massachusetts. The, um, the, the ladies, they were trained for more than just the basic reading and writing skills that they were used to. It was enlightening them, it was thinking with their head, how to do things with their hands, and how to all, always think with their hearts as well. So the three principles w was the hand, the head, and the heart. That school in Massachusetts was started to train uh, girls to be Christian teachers. Andrew Murray, learning about this, uh, has now written to that school and asked for two teachers to come. One, in fact. We feel the need of a special effort to secure the rising generation for Christ. The spirit of the world has commenced its struggle for the ascendancy. Under the strong impression that education, no less than the ministry of the gospel, is a means of grace and the channel for the working of the blessed Holy Spirit, 
we are anxious to have a school in which shall be sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That uh, college in the 1870s got this letter. They said, wow. They said, let's make this two people, not just one. They were Miss Ferguson and Miss Bliss and were sent to Wellington to help Andrew establish the Huguenot Seminary. They became so committed to the work that they both remained in Wellington for the rest of their lives. They really transformed or gave birth to a unique approach to respecting God in public school education in this country. There's no doubt, no one would deny that. And they start that school in 1874 with 50 some odd students. February 26, what shall I render to the Lord for all his marvelous works? We have just had our Thursday evening meeting and we gathered together a united family in the Lord. We have been asking this of him and he has given it. Blessed be his holy name. At the end of the first month, as best these Christian teachers could see, their entire charge of girls had understood that faith needs to be personal and primary in our lives. And records exist and would support a most remarkable thing. Just as Andrew Murray believed that education should be the basis for the Holy Spirit to begin working in the life of a young person, not separating maths and English and all the usual subjects in history, but bringing it together within a framework of finding out what God wants to do for your life and take your place serving God in one or another of these things. Uh, that was the nature of what Andrew Mary had in mind to start a school here. Well, it started with 54 pupils in 1874 and over the years stretched out to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Year after year graduating more and more girls, more and more schools starting in South Africa with a Christian foundation, studying the Bible as part of school. We have records of people who came from other provinces simply for the type of education that was offered at the Huguenot Seminary. With that, hand in hand, was the establishment of beautiful buildings that is very well kept and forms an integral part of what Wellington has to offer. Because today, all the reference for a stranger going by will just be names, but for people living in Wellington, you will recognize the, the coming surnames, the Bliss, the Fergusons, and they all form such an integral part of Wellington. Even um, the house that Andrew Murray lived in, Clevo, um, is still well kept. And um, I think it is impossible to speak of Wellington and not think of the education side of what was established. Andrew Murray was also much concerned with the missionary cause and the training of missionaries. Just a few years after establishing the Huguenot Seminary, he established the Missionary Institute in Wellington. Dr. Ferguson from America was the first lecturer. He was the brother of Miss Ferguson. As you go to it, you can see the name Samuel of the Bible. Samuel who has received from the Lord miraculously, who is given back to the Lord sacrificially. And so all around the building, you will see when you go there, the Great Commission is written there. On the left of that building, the words are van den Heere gebeden, prayed for. And on the right after the word Samuel is ook den Heere over gegeven, given back to the Lord, to God. Andrew Murray taught, and mind you, he was the leader of the entire Dutch Reformed Church. He believed that infant baptism was a giving back to God of the blessing that the families had received from God in like manner as Hannah gave her child back to God in the Old Testament. And it was built in 1883 by this local Dutch Reformed Church its purpose was world evangelization with a focus on Africa. Andrew Murray was the founder of the Dutch Reformed Church Missionary Department. And in those days, the 19th century, that meant going to places where people don't have the, the good news and seeing to it that they do. 
Later, they started a school for women, also with that same calling. Their motto was Africa for Christus. Now, I'm an American, and if anybody listening to this doesn't understand what Africa for Christus means, you can pretty much guess it means Africa for Christ. But the only group to ever claim the continent of Africa was Andrew Murray and the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa. As you travel around Africa, you see the amount of missionaries who got their training in Wellington, who planted churches that are the most important and dynamic churches all over Africa. And whether you go to Morgan Stair in Zimbabwe or to Nkoma Mission Station in uh, Malawi, and I've come across missionaries from the Cape, their graves, as far as Ni in Nigeria. When I went to Nigeria in 2003 for the first time, the people there were celebrating uh, the centenary of the coming of the first missionaries to the area. And these people, the Tiv people in, in eastern Nigeria, uh, they said, our missionaries came from Wellington. Andrew Murray sent them out. Uh, they were the four, first reformed missionaries here. Many of the students went on to pioneer mission work in Malawi, Lesotho, Nigeria, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland, Sudan, and South Africa. After Andrew's father died, years earlier in 1866, his younger brother Charles had become the minister at Hrafrinet. Andrew's sisters had married ministers, except Helen, and his brothers became ministers, except James. In the years to come, many of the Murrays and their descendants would become missionaries and ministers. Andrew Murray was known uh, as a very uh, emotive and forceful preacher. And when he even spoke to people, it was sometimes a little bit of a sermon as well as talking. He was a gentle person, but there was no uh, restriction on his ability to, to speak. He lost his voice and began reading carefully scriptures perhaps that he hadn't spent as much time looking at and that has to do with healing. And as you know, there is a fair amount of material uh, in the Gospels and in the epistles after that that have to do with, with healing. His voice was restored. I think it was about a two year period in which he couldn't speak. And that led him to uh, write from a, uh, an approach which seemed certainly to indicate that the healing was uh, something that each believer could, could seek. He had to uh, come to an understanding that healing is not always in the will of God. Uh, it is wrong for us to automatically assume there's a big difference between faith and presumption. Faith is trusting God. Presumption is telling God what we believe His will should be. And so uh, Andrew Murray's writings went through a much greater maturing and, and depth as a result of these hard experiences. In 1880, war broke out between Britain and the Boers. Britain had tried to annex the Republic of the Transvaal. The Boers defeated the invading British forces, managing to secure an uneasy peace but it didn't last. Warfare broke out at the, in the end of the 19th century between the Afrikaans people here and the British government. The independent republics of the Free State and the Transvaal uh, were to be taken over by the British government and made into one country with the Cape Province and Natal, and it lasted for three years. Andrew Murray was by no means convinced that Britain needed to run all four provinces. 450,000 soldiers came here. That's as many as were in Vietnam in the 1970s. And over time, in three years' time, uh, they overwhelmed the Afrikaans people uh, with much bitterness, not to mention unduly, that they had a slash and burn uh, method of overcoming their opposite, uh, opposition because that's where they got their food. And um, they then took the women from those farms and brought them into camps in various places in tents and they called them concentration camps in 1900, 1901. 
and the women weren't used to that. The food was not always available or right. The weather was, well, if you're here in the, in the South African seasons, you'd know the weather was not always camping out weather. 25,000 women and children died. And it was on the basis of that that the Afrikaans people surrendered, not because they'd been defeated, but because they knew that if they continued to fight, their families would be further decimated. Now you can imagine the anger and the negativity that flowed out of that. Andrew, for a time, had been the only minister to the Four Trekkers and spent 10 years traveling and ministering among the Boers in the Orange Free State and Transvaal. He regarded them as his people and was deeply saddened by the war. Andrew Murray was famous in his time as an author, as a public speaker, as a revivalist, as uh, one whose message of holiness and of abiding in Christ and of full surrender to Christ and of being with Christ in a school of prayer and being with Christ in a school of obedience uh, and the key to the missionary problem. So many great materials that came out of Andrew Murray's teaching, preaching and writing ministry were enriching the church in his time and the impact and the contribution that Andrew Murray made to the greatest century of missions, the 19th century, cannot be exaggerated. And he became one of the most popular and most powerful revival speakers and writers, very much sought after in Europe and in America on speaking tours in order to lecture and teach on the subject of revival. Most of his material is on the what I'd call the world of the supernatural, where you connect with God. That was his understanding. Let us take hold as Christians of the supernatural God in all aspects. His initial writings was to establish the body of Christ in the Word of God, that's clear. But it didn't stay that way. He moved more as time went on into the responsibilities of the body of Christ and the responsibilities of Christians to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the first book he wrote focused on missions was in 1901. It was his reaction to that conference that he'd been invited to by Mr. Moody that he couldn't go to. But he read the, the, the notes. They must have had terrific stenographers in those days that every word of the conference was there for him to read. They used the phrase, the missionary problem, the missionary problem at the conference. He writes a book called The Key to the Missionary Problem. And that is that we understand the biblical balance of God bless us so that we can be part of his plan to finish the Great Commission. It is so hot that you will be surprised. But that wasn't the last one that he wrote. There was another conference scheduled for um, 1910 called Edinburgh, a world missions conference. By then he's too old but he writes a book called The State of the Church as his contribution to the international dialogue, you'd say. And it is bordering on the scathing. And he is referring to the state of the church as unequal to the task of finishing the Great Commission. But not just criticizing it, he goes beyond that to explain how that can be dealt with. So Andrew Murray's ministry goes out in a blaze of glory if you understand that he was primarily interested in the completion of the Great Commission. The church was a means to an end and a glorious means to an end. And a Christian who had gives his life to Christ enters into the realm of responsibility Psalm 67 says, May God be gracious unto us, verse 1, and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that thy ways may be known on the earth, thy salvation among all nations. It's a so that. In Afrikaans, they actually use the word sudat which means so that after those first three, God be gracious unto us, bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us. Murray 
is not as well known for that as he deserves to be. We reprinted this book ourselves. We're just a plain, simple uh, group of uh, folk. We don't teach Andrew Murray. We teach the Bible, but he sure helps us. The message today is often sensational and shallow and superficial and materialistic. And to cut through that and bring in this refreshing living waters, this prophetic voice from the 19th century, which is calling us to fear God, to see the holiness of God, to put our devotions to God right up center, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, to abide in Christ, to learn obedience. If you love me, you'll obey my commands, Jesus said. Now this, this kind of radical discipleship and this kind of wholehearted devotion to Christ, this wholehearted surrender to the will of God, that is what we need in our church today. I think that's the thing about Andrew Murray. It's head and heart. It's not only doctrine, but it's devotion. It's not only backbones of doctrinal steel, it's Holy Spirit fire. But of all his short and sweet uh, phrases, the one that strikes me the most is this, the God of the past is the God of the future. The quote that comes to me as so convicting as Andrew challenged the people close to, to his death in, in 1917, he said, God is more eager to answer our prayers for revival than we are to pray them. And so many people actually don't want revival. We might talk about revival a lot, but revival brings with it such responsibilities and with the blessings comes such a renewed commitment to what really matters, the Great Commission and the Kingdom of God, that actually most people don't want the revival. God's more eager to send it than we are to seek it. Andrew Murray died in 1917. He was a prolific writer and left a legacy of over 240 books, booklets and pamphlets. Many of his books are still being printed in numerous languages and they're being read around the world today.